adopted. So when we speak of the Dharma of the Buddha, the Buddha's doctrine, it is the Buddha's method, not law. So a, a citizen also has to conform to Dharma. And uh, that is to say to ritual and ethical and moral game rules for the community. But now, when in the course of time he has established his household, he has taught his oldest son to take over the governorship of the household, the father, or for that matter, mother, may enter into a new stage of life altogether, which is not grihastha, but is called vanaprastha, and that means forest dweller, as distinct from householder. Now you see what's happened. We've gone full cycle. We came out of the forest as a hunter. We settled in a community and indulged in what is called in Sanskrit loka sangraha. Sangraha means upholding. Loka, the world. Upholding the world game. And that is everybody's dharma or duty. Dharma can also be translated duty. And svadharma, S-V-A in front of dharma, means your own duty. Or better, your own function, which we would translate into English as vocation. So everybody's caste work is his svadharma, and, of course, these castes are subdivided into various other kinds of specializations. Now, let us get practical. You say, OK, I understand what you are saying theoretically. But I know that I would be terrified if somebody was going to tell me that I'm going to die. And that I would look frantically around for some doctor, some sort of something that this panic to live is in us in an uncontrollable way, and this is part of the reason why we say we have an instinct to survive. The instinct is this panic. So let's take another step now, in the same way as I showed you steps about realizing that you don't have an ego. You say to yourself in the ordinary way, when you feel that panic, you feel a bit ashamed of it even though you've been taught that you should do everything possible to survive. See what a bind you're in here? So one feels, oh goodness, I must face this thing calmly and bravely and not be in this panic. But the point of the fact is, you are in a panic and you can't stop it. Now that's very important. Because this is another way of showing you the same thing that death is showing you, that you can't do anything about it. Just as when you finally realize you can't do anything about the death, you could have solved all that before by understanding you couldn't do anything about the panic. But if you think all the time, I'm supposed to stop this panic, then all that happens is you're at cross purposes with yourself again. The panic is, of course, put off in the ordinary way. We all know we're going to die. But it's sufficiently far off so that we can put it out of our minds. And anybody who does put it into our minds in the ordinary way is taken to be a skeleton at the banquet, a Cassandra, and gloomy, so that the old-fashioned preacher of bygone days who preached about death and those monks who kept skulls on their desks and uh, all that sort of thing is regarded today as very morbid. Why, in the Baroque times, there was a fashion for a while of making tombstones with marvellous sculptures of skeletons and bones all over them. And on the Via Veneto in Rome, there is a Capuchin church 
where down in the crypt there are chapels made where the altar furnishings and everything are made entirely from the bones of departed monks. Then we have in among Tibetans and in Buddhists graveyard meditations and they have trumpets in Tibetan Buddhism made of human thigh bones and they have cups, ritual cups made of the domes of human skulls richly worked in silver and turquoise. And we say all that is very morbid. So from this point of view you can see first of all theoretically how death can solve its own problem. Now, if you say, I can only see it theoretically, and I can't go the whole way with you, then I will ask you, what is blocking you? Will you say, it gives me the heebie-jeebies and the horrors? I say, all right, so death is not the problem, the heebie-jeebies is the problem. So let's deal with the heebie-jeebies in the same way as with death, you cannot stop the heebie-jeebies. You think you should. I say, don't. The heebie-jeebies are very valuable. Not that they will stop you from dying, but because from them you will learn the same thing as you would learn from dying. But the social pressure on you to resist the heebie-jeebies is terrific. Now, why must you do that? Why is everybody saying these heebie-jeebies, these fears, etc., are not permissible? You wonder about that. And the reasoning behind all that is not very clear because it seems to be saying, well, if you have all these fears and things like that, you, you won't be a very good soldier. You won't be able to act competently in a crisis. You'll get the heebie-jeebies instead and you won't know what to do. Well, nobody has ever really proved that. Because actually, people who we would call very courageous are in fact often quite frightened. And courageous action is not necessarily a consequence of having no fear. Sometimes it might be, but it isn't always so. The real reason why the heebie-jeebies are suppressed has more to do with its orgiastic aspects. But let's suppose now you are babies again, and you don't know anything. Now, don't be frightened, because anything you know you can get back later. But for the time being, here is our awareness. And let's suppose you have no information about this at all and no words for it. And that my talking to you is just a noise. Now, don't try to do anything about this. Don't make any effort. Because, naturally, by force of habit, certain tensions remain inside you and certain ideas and words drift all the time through your mind. Just like um, the wind blows or clouds move across the sky. Don't bother with them at all. Don't try to get rid of them. Just be aware of what's going on in your head. like it was clouds in the sky or the crackling of the fire. There's no problem to this. All you have to do, really, is look and listen without naming. And if you are naming, never mind. Just listen to that. Now, that you can't force anything here, that you can't willfully stop 
thinking and stop naming is only telling you that the separate you doesn't exist. It isn't a mark of defeat. It isn't a sign of your lack of practice in meditation. That it runs on all by itself simply means that the individual separate you is a figment of your imagination. So you are aware at this point of a happening. Remember, you don't know anything about the difference between you and it. You haven't been told that. You've no words for the difference between inside and outside, between here and there. And nobody has taught you that what you see out in front of you is either near or far from your eyes. Watch a baby put out a finger to touch the moon. You don't know about that. You just, therefore, here it is. We'll just call it this. And if you will feel it, the going on, which includes absolutely everything you feel, Well, whatever that is, it's what the Chinese call Tao, what Buddhists call suchness or Tathata. And it's a happening. It doesn't happen to you, because where is that? You, what you call you, is part of the happening, <laughs> or an aspect of it has no parts, it's not like a machine. And it's a little scary because you'd say, well, who's in control around here? Why should there be anyone? Now, that's an, a very weird notion we have that processes require something outside them to control them. It never occurred to us that processes could be self-controlling. Even though we say to someone, control yourself. We can always, <laughs> in order to think about self-control, we split a person in two. So that there's a you separate from the self that's supposed to be controlled. Well, how can that achieve anything? How can a noun start a verb? Yet it's a fundamental superstition that that can be done. In Buddhism, Change is emphasized, first to unsettle people who think that they can achieve permanence by hanging on to life. And it seems that the preacher is wagging his finger at them and saying, you know, like the Scotch preacher one day saying to Sunday congregation, preaching on the text, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And what about the rich food you put into your mouths? It is vanity. And the fine raiment you put on your bucks, it is vanity. And all your playing around going to golf instead of coming to the kirk of the Sabbath, it is vanity. And you'll be spending all your lives devoted to vanity. And the last day will come the day of your death. And because you've devoted your life to vanity, you'll go down to the burning, fiery brimstone pits of hell. And there you'll look up and say unto the Lord, Oh, Lord, I didn't know it. Oh, Lord, I wouldn't have devoted my life to vanity if I'd known it. Oh, Lord. And the Lord, he'll look down, and he'll say unto you, out of his infinite mercy, well, you know it now. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So all the preachers together, you should say, don't cling to this thing. So then, as a result of that, and now I'm going to speak in strictly Buddhist terms, the follower of the way of Buddha seeks deliverance from attachment to the world of change. He seeks nirvana, the state beyond change, which the Buddha called the unborn, the unoriginated, the uncreated, and the unformed. But then you see, what he finds out is that in seeking a state beyond change, seeking nirvana as something away from samsara, which is the name for the wheel, he is still seeking something permanent. And so there are, in, in, as Buddhism went on, they thought about this a great deal. And this very point was the point of division between the two great schools of Buddhism, which in the south were Theravada, the doctrine of the Thera, the elders, sometimes known disrespectfully as the Hinayana. Yana means a vehicle, a conveyance, a diligence, a, uh, or a ferry boat. This is a yana. <coughs> and I live on a ferry boat because um, that's my job. <laughs> then there is the other school of Buddhism called the Mahayana. Maha means great. Hina, little. The great vehicle and the little vehicle. Now, what is this? The Mahayanas say, your little vehicle just gets a few people who are very, very tough ascetics and takes them across the other shore to Nirvana. But the great vehicle shows people that nirvana is not different from ordinary life. So that when you have reached nirvana, if you think, now I have attained it, now I have succeeded, now I have caught the secret of the universe, and I'm at peace. You have only a false peace. You have become a stone Buddha. You have a new illusion of the changeless. So it is said that such a person is a Pratyeka Buddha. That means private Buddha. I've got it all for myself. And in contrast with this kind of Pratyeka Buddha, who gains Nirvana and stays there, the Mahayanists use the word Bodhisattva. Sattva means uh, essential principle, Bodhi, awakening. A person whose essential being is awakened. The word used to mean junior Buddha someone on the way to becoming a Buddha. But in the course of time, it came to mean someone who had attained Buddhahood, who had reached Nirvana, but who returns into everyday life to deliver all other beings. This is the popular idea of a Bodhisattva, a savior. And so, in the popular Buddhism of Tibet and China and Japan, people worship the bodhisattvas, the great bodhisattvas, as saviors. Say the hermaphroditic Kuan Yin. People love Kuan Yin because she 
he, she, she, he, could be a Buddha, but has come back into the world to save all beings. The Japanese call he, she, Kanon. And they have in Kyoto an image of Kanon with 1,000 arms radiating like a great aureole all round this great golden figure. And these 1,000 arms are 1,000 different ways of rescuing beings from ignorance. Kanon is a funny thing. I remember one night when I suddenly realized that Kanon was incarnate in the whole city of Kyoto, that this whole city was Kanon, that the police department, the taxi drivers, the fire department, the mayor and corporation, the shopkeepers, in so far as this whole city was a collaborate effort to sustain human life, however bumbling, however inefficient, however corrupt, it was still a manifestation of Kanon with its thousand arms, all working independently, and yet one. So they revere those bodhisattvas as the saviors who've come back into the world to deliver all beings. But there is a more esoteric interpretation of this. The bodhisattva returns into the world that means he has discovered that you don't have to go anywhere to find nirvana. Nirvana is where you are, provided you don't object to it. The next thing that comes up, the second of the noble truths, is about the cause of suffering. And this in Sanskrit is called Trishna. Trishna is related to our word thirst. It's very often translated desire. That will do. Better perhaps is craving, clinging, grasping, or even to use our modern psychological word blocking. When, for example, somebody is blocked and dithers and hesitates and doesn't know what to do, he is, in the strictest Buddhist sense, attached. He's stuck. But a Buddha can't be stuck. He cannot be phased. He always flows, just as water always flows, even if you dam it. The river just keeps on getting higher and higher and higher until it flows over the dam. It's unstoppable. Now, Buddha said then, Dukkha comes from Trishna. You all suffer because you cling to the world and you don't recognize that the world is Anitya and Anatman. So then, try if you can, not to grasp. Well, do you see that that immediately poses a problem? Because the student who has started off this dialogue with the Buddha <coughs> then makes various efforts to give up desire. Upon which he very rapidly discovers that he is desiring not to desire. And he takes that back to the teacher, who says, well, well, well. He said, of course, you are desiring not to desire, and that's, of course, excessive. All I want you to do is to give up desiring as much as you can. Don't want to go beyond the point of which you're capable. And for this reason, Buddhism is called the middle way. Not only is it the middle way between the extremes of ascetic discipline and pleasure-seeking, 
but it's also the middle way in a very subtle sense. Yes, don't desire to give up more desire than you can. And if you find that a problem, don't desire to be successful in giving up more desire than you can. You see what's happening? At every time he's returned to the middle way, he is moved out of an extreme situation. Now then, we'll go on. We'll cut out what happens in the pursuit of that method until a little later. The next truth in the list is concerned with the, the nature of release from dukkha. And so number three is nirvana. Nirvana is the goal of Buddhism. It's the state of liberation corresponding to what the Hindus call moksha. The word means blow out. Ni, and it comes from the root ni vritti. Now, some people think that what it means is blowing out the flame of desire. I don't believe this. I believe that it means breathe out rather than blow out. Because if you try to hold your breath, and in, in Indian thought, prana, breath, is the life principle. If you try to hold on to life, you lose it. You can't hold your breath and stay alive. It becomes extremely uncomfortable to hold on to your breath. And so in exactly the same way, it becomes extremely uncomfortable to spend all your time holding on to life. What to the devil is the point of surviving, going on living, when it's a drag. But you see, that's what people do. They spend enormous efforts on maintaining a certain standard of living, which is a great deal of trouble. You know, you get a nice house in the suburbs, and the first thing you do is you plant a lawn. And you've got to get out and mow the damn thing all the time. And you buy uh, expensive this, that, and soon you're all involved in mortgages and Instead of uh, being able to walk out in the garden and enjoy it, you sit at your desk looking at all the books and filling out this, that, and the other, and paying bills and answering letters. What, what a lot of rot. But you see, that is holding on to life. So, translated into... colloquial America, nirvana is because <laughs> if you let your breath go, it'll come back. So nirvana is not annihilation. It's not disappearance into a sort of undifferentiated void. Nirvana is the state of being let go. It is a state of consciousness and a state of, you might call it, being here and now in this life. Well now, the essential of this whole system, as you see, is to use a hair of the dog that bit you for the cure of the bite. It's homeopathic. When people are under delusion, they cannot be talked out of the delusion. No amount of talk could persuade anybody that his ego is an illusion. Because he knows it's there. He knows I am I. And simply won't believe you if you tell him that this is nothing but post-hypnotic suggestion. So the only way to convince a fool of, in, of his folly is to make him persist in it. As Blake says, the fool who persists in his folly will become wise. By some psychiatrists I know, I know when they get a person who overeats and is tremendously fat, 
the first thing they do is they make them put on 15 more pounds. <laughs> and uh, get, the, get an alcoholic terribly drunk. <laughs> oh, and sick and just as awful as could be, you see. Really make him go at it. See. That's, that's the method that's used. Sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It's a rather desperate method. Rather dangerous method. Zen is dangerous too. People could easily go crazy under this sort of strain without a good advisor. Well, it is clear, of course, that this method of Zen training is most unsuited to the modern age. And this is witnessed, too, by the fact that the temples are relatively empty. Myoshinji, the biggest one in Kyoto, is built to house 600 monks. There are only 80. And uh, you might think that was quite a crowd, but it isn't compared with the old days. To young people in Japan today, this is all... We now come to the most complicated of all. The f number four, Marga. Marga in Sanskrit means path. And the Buddha taught an eightfold path for the realization of nirvana. This re always reminds me of a story about Dr. Suzuki, who, was a, who is a very, very great Buddhist scholar. And uh, many years ago, he was giving a fundamental lecture on Buddhism at the University of Hawaii. And he got to, he'd been going through these four truths, and he said, Ah, fourth noble truth is Kora Noble Eightfold Path. Far step of a uh, noble eightfold path called a uh, Shoken. Shoken Japanese mean uh, right view. For a Buddhism, fundamentally is right view, right way of viewing this world. Second step of Noble Eightfold Path is, uh, oh, I forget second step. You look it up in the book. <laughs> oh, well, I'm going to do rather the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> what is important is this. The Eightfold Path has uh, really got three divisions in it. The first are concerned with understanding. The second division is concerned with conduct. And the third division is concerned with meditation. And every step in the path is preceded by the Sanskrit word samyak, in which sam is the key word, in Pali, samma. And so the first step, samyak drishti, which means, drishti means a view, a way of looking at things, a vision, an attitude, something like that. But this word samyak is in ordinary texts on Buddhism almost invariably translated right. This is a very bad translation. It does, of course, the word is used in certain contexts in Sanskrit to mean right, correct. But it has other and wider meanings. Sam means, like our word sum, which is derived from it, complete, total, all-embracing. It also has the meaning of middle way, uh, representing, as it were, the fulcrum, the center, the point of balance in a totality. 
middle-wayed way of looking at things, middle-wayed way of understanding the Dharma, middle-wayed way of speech, of conduct, of livelihood, and so on. Now, this is particularly cogent when it comes to Buddhist ideas of behavior. Wherever the human organism gets into a certain kind of extreme, it starts an oscillating process going. Just as it does in sexual orgasm, and that oscillating process will inspire in others an emotion which they cannot identify either as disgust or as lust. They don't know quite what it is. All those extreme situations, terror, and as we shall see more, response to pain, have an orgiastic quality. And they are therefore embarrassing because they conflict with our image of ourselves as in control, composed, deported. <laughs> That's in the sense of deportment. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, it would be shameful, in a way, you, you might not want to look at your own face in a state of complete sexual rapture. As a matter of fact, if you saw a photograph of your face, you wouldn't be able to tell whether you were in pleasure or in pain. It might be either. Because then, you see, what has happened is that a tide, a vibration, a pulsation, has taken over the whole being. So that you are, as it were, in the possession of a god. And that's something taboo. So we begin here to move into a very difficult area because a lot of people were beginning to say this conversation is getting out of line because we are moving into what are normally called perverse experiences. And the two critical forms of perverse experience are sadism and masochism. Where there is the association of pain and ecstasy. In sadism, the confusion of another person's suffering with that person's sexual orgasm. In masochism, the identification, or if you want to say confusion, of your own suffering with sexual orgasm. Now we say, well, that's, uh, that's pathological, that's absurd. But it exists. People do it all the time, both ways, and sometimes both together. And although this is generally put under the heading of pathology, the fact remains that we can still learn something from it. There's an important principle in there. Somehow, somewhere. And perhaps in people who are sadists and masochists, the phenomenon is somehow out of hand because they don't understand the principle. Now, do you realize many sadists want nothing more than that their victim should enjoy the pain. The combination sadist and masochist is perfect. And many sadists would be quite reluctant 
if the victim really didn't like participating in this at all. And so there's the joke of the masochist asking the sadist to beat him, and he says, I won't. <laughs> But what happens here is that pain and the attendant convulsive behavior of the organism is associated with the erotic. A different value is given to the same symptoms as, say, it is common in France to get a young woman really aroused. You know? And she will say, Chimwa, Chimwa, kill me, kill me. As if to you know, to go as far as you can in throwing yourself away to somebody else. You know, do anything you want to. And in that abandon, you see, there is the possibility that this an undulation of feeling, which is total orgiastic feeling, may take over. And in that feeling, you see, you are one with what is happening completely. And that's what everybody, as it were, finally aspires to. So, therefore, the masochist in particular is a person who has learned throughout life to defend himself against pain by eroticizing pain. Now, do you understand how, therefore, different valuations can be put on one and the same vibration? This particular weekend seminar is devoted to Buddhism, and it should be said first that there is a sense in which Buddhism is Hinduism stripped for export. Last week when I discussed Hinduism, I discussed many things to do with the organization of Hindu society. Because Hinduism is not merely what we call a religion, it's a whole culture. It's a legal system, it's a social system, it's a system of etiquette, and it includes everything. It includes housing, it includes food, it includes art, because the Hindus and many other ancient peoples do not make, as we do, a division between religion and everything else. Religion is not a department of life. It is something that enters into the whole of it. But you see, when a religion and a culture are inseparable, it's very difficult to export a culture because it comes into conflict with the established traditions, manners and customs of other people. So the question arises, what are the essentials of Hinduism that could be exported? And when you answer that, approximately, you'll get Buddhism. As I explained, the essential of Hinduism, the real deep root, isn't any kind of doctrine it isn't really any special kind of discipline, although, of course, disciplines are involved. The center of Hinduism is an experience called moksha, liberation, in which, through the dissipation of the illusion that each man and each woman is a separate thing in a world consisting of nothing but a collection of separate things, you discover that you are on one level an illusion, but on another level you are what they call the self, the one self, which is all that there is. The universe is the game of the self which plays hide-and-seek forever and ever. When it plays hide, it plays it so well, hides so cleverly, that it pretends to be all of us. 
and all things whatsoever, and we don't know it because it's playing hide. But when it plays seek, it enters onto a path of yoga, and through following this path, it wakes up, and the scales fall from one's eyes. Now, in just the same way, the center of Buddhism, the only really important thing about Buddhism is the experience which they call awakening. Buddha is a title and not a proper name. It comes from a Sanskrit root, Buddh, and that sometimes means to know, but better, waking. And so you get from this root, Bodhi, that is the state of being awakened, and so Buddha the awakened one, the awakened person. And so there can, of course, in Buddhist ideas, be very many Buddhas. The person called the Buddha is only one of myriads, because they, like the Hindus, are quite sure that our world is only one among billions, and that Buddhas come and go in all the worlds. But sometimes, you see, there comes into the world what you might call a big Buddha, a very important one. And such a one is said to have been Gotama, the son of a prince living in northern India, in the part of the world we now call Nepal, living shortly after 600 BC. All dates in Indian history are vague, and so I never try to get you to remember any precise date, like 564, which some people think it was. But just after 600 BC is probably right. Most of you, I'm sure, know the story of his life. But the point is that when in India a man was called a Buddha or the Buddha, this is a title of a very exalted nature. It is first of all necessary for a Buddha to be human. He can't be any other kind of being whether in the Hindu uh, scale of beings he's above the human state or below it. He is superior to all gods because according to Indian ideas, gods and angels, or angels would probably be a better name for them than gods, all those exalted beings are still in the wheel of becoming, still in the chains of karma, that is action which requires the need for more action to complete it and goes on requiring the need for more action. They are still, according to popular ideas, going round the wheel from life after life after life after life because they still have the thirst for existence or to put it in a Hindu way, in them the self is still playing the game of not being itself. But the Buddha's doctrine, based on his own experience of awakening, which occurred after seven years of attempts to study with the various yogis of the time, all of whom used the method of extreme asceticism, fasting, doing all sorts of exercises, lying on beds of nails, sleeping on broken rocks, any kind of thing to break down egocentricity, 
to become unselfish, to become detached, to exterminate desire for life. But Buddha found that all that was futile. That was not the way. And one day he broke his ascetic discipline and accepted a bowl of some kind of milk soup from a girl who was looking after cattle. And suddenly, in this tremendous relaxation, he went and sat down under a tree, and the burden lifted. He saw completely that what he had been doing was on the wrong track. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And no amount of effort will make a person who believes himself to be an ego be really unselfish. So long as you think and feel that you are a somewhat contained in your bag of skin, and that's all, there is no way whatsoever of your behaving unselfishly. Oh yes, you can imitate unselfishness. You can go through all sorts of highly refined uh, forms of selfishness, but you're still tied to the wheel of becoming by the golden chains of your good deeds, as the obviously bad people are tied to it by the iron chains of their misbehaviors. So you have this process, which is quite spontaneous, going on. We call it life. It's controlling itself. It's aware of itself. It's aware of itself through you. You are an aperture through which the universe looks at itself. And because of it's the universe looking at itself through you, there's always an aspect of itself that it can't see. So it is like that snake, you see, that is pursuing its tail. Because the snake can't see its head, like you can't. We always find, as we investigate the universe, make the microscope bigger and bigger, and we will find ever more minute things. Make the telescope bigger and bigger and bigger, and the universe expands because it's running away from itself. It won't do that if you don't chase it. <laughs> so, it's a game of hide and seek. Really, when you ask the question, who is doing the chasing, you are still working under the assumption that every verb has to have a subject. That when there is an action, there has to be a doer. Well, that's a, what I will call a grammatical convention leading to what Whitehead called the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Like the famous it in It Is Raining. So when you say, there cannot be knowing without a knower, this is merely saying, no more than there can't be a verb without a subject. And that's a grammatical rule and not a law of nature. Anything you can think of as a thing, as a noun, can be described by a verb. And there are languages which do that. It sounds awkward in English, but face it, when you look for doers as distinct from deeds, you can't find them. Just as when you look for stuff underlying the patterns of nature, you can't find any stuff, you just find more and more patterns. There never was any stuff. It's a ghost. What we call stuff is simply patterns seen out of focus. And it's fuzzy. So we call it stuff. 
<laughs> you know, it's a cakewalk. <laughs> so, you know, we have these words, energy, matter, being, reality, even Tao. And we can never find them. They always elude us entirely. Although we do have the very strong intuition that all this that we see is connected or related. So we speak of a universe, although that word really means one term. It's your turn now. <laughs> or like you make one turn to look at yourself, but you can't make two turns and see what's looking. <laughs> so it's very simple, therefore. You only have to understand that you can't do anything about it. And as they say in Zen, you cannot take hold of it, but you can't get rid of it. And in not being able to get it, you get it. So all these trials that gurus put their students through have as their ultimate object convincing you that you can't do anything. Only it's convincing you very thoroughly. It's convincing you in more than a theoretical way. Now, perhaps I shouldn't tell you that. But you see, I'm not a guru in that I don't give individual spiritual direction to people. And I give away the guru's tricks. That may not be very good, but on the other hand, those tricks are only necessary in the sense that I would say to someone, it's necessary for you to go to a psychiatrist if you think you must. And if you are not going to be satisfied without going to Japan and studying Zen Buddhism from a Roshi, okay, you better go. It isn't necessary unless you say it is. If that's the only thing that will satisfy you, and you feel that deep down inside you. If you've got that yen, therefore you've got that yen. But if on the other hand you haven't, you haven't. And I'm not going to put you down on that account, you see. The point is, what do you want to do? What is it in you to do? But there it is. That you can struggle and struggle and struggle. And indeed will do so. As long as you have the feeling inside you that you're missing something. And people, your friends, all sorts of people will do their utmost to persuade you that you're missing something. <laughs> because they're missing something and they think they're getting it through a certain way. And therefore, to assure themselves, they'd like you to do it too. Service this thing. And you see, a clever guru beguiles his students by letting them have the feeling of success and accomplishment in certain directions. A guru gives people exercises, A, that are difficult but can be accomplished, and B, that are impossible. You'll always be hung up on the impossible ones, but the possible ones, you will feel, get a feeling of making progress so that you will double your efforts to solve the impossible exercises. And then they range things in many, many ranks and levels through which you can advance. This stage of consciousness, that state of consciousness, or think of the degrees of masonry, or so on. Ranks in learning things, the different belts you get in judo and all that kind of jazz. You can do that. And it gives people the sense of competing with themselves or even with others. Because of the feeling inside that there is just something I'm missing. And of course, if you are learning any sort of skill and you haven't perfected the skill, there is indeed something you're missing. But in this thing that we're talking about, that isn't true. Because you, as the Buddhists say, are Buddhas from the very beginning. And all that 
searching is like looking for your own head, which you can't see and therefore might conceivably imagine that you'd lost. So that indeed is the point, that we don't see what looks and therefore we think we've lost it. And so we're in search of the self, the Atman. Well, that's the one thing we can't find. <laughs> because we have it. We are it. <laughs> but we confuse it with all these images. Every Buddhist in all the world, practically, as a layman, if he's not a monk, undertakes what are called panchasila, the five good conducts. Sila, S-I-L-A, is sometimes translated precept. But it's not a precept because it's not a commandment. The formula, when a Buddhist, you know, these priests say chant the precepts, you know, and that means panatipata. Pana is in Pali, this thing. Prana, life. Tipata, taking away. I promise to abstain from. So the first is that one undertakes not to destroy life. Second, not to take what is not given. Third, ho oh, ho, this is usually translated, not to commit adultery. It doesn't say, it doesn't say anything of the kind. In Sanskrit, kamesu mityahara, veramani sikapadam samadhyami. Kamesu mityahara means I undertake the precept to abstain from exploiting my passions. Buddhism has no doctrine about adultery. You may have as many wives as you like. But the point is this. When you're feeling blue and bored, it's not a good idea to have a drink because you may become dependent on alcohol whenever you feel unhappy. So in the same way, when you're feeling blue and bored, it's not a good idea and say, let's go out and get some chicks and uh, have some sex fun. That's exploiting the passions. But it's not exploiting the passions, you see. When drinking, say, expresses the conviviality and friendship of a group sitting around the dinner table, or when sex expresses the spontaneous delight of two people in each other. Then the fourth precept, musavada, to abstain from false speech. This doesn't simply mean lying. It means abusing people. It means using speech in a phony way, like saying, all niggers are thus and so or uh, the attitude of America to this situation is thus and thus. You see, that's phony kind of talking. Anybody who studies general semantics will be helped in avoiding musavada, false speech. The final precept is a very complicated one and nobody's quite sure exactly what it means. It mentions three kinds of drugs and drinks. Sura, Merya, Maja, Pamadatana. We don't know what they are. <laughs> but at any rate, it's generally uh, classed that narcotics and liquors. Now, there are two ways of translating this precept. One says to abstain from narcotics and liquors. The other liberal translation favored by the great scholar Dr. Malala Sekera is I abstain from being intoxicated by these things. 
So if you drink and don't get intoxicated, it's okay. You see? You don't have to be a teetotaler to be a Buddhist. And this is especially true in Japan and China. My goodness, how they throw it down. <laughs> uh, once a, a, a scholarly Chinese said to me, you know, uh, before you start meditating, just have a couple of martinis because it increases your progress by about six months. <laughs> well, now you see these are, as I say, they are not, they are not commandments, they are vows. Buddhism has in it no idea of there being a moral law laid down by some kind of cosmic lawgiver. And the reason why these precepts are undertaken is not for a sentimental reason. It is not that you're going to make you into a good person. It is that for anybody interested in the experiments necessary for liberation, these ways of life are expedient. First of all, if you go around killing, you're going to make enemies. And you're going to have to spend a lot of time defending yourself, which will distract you from your yoga. If you go around stealing, likewise, you're going to acquire a heap of stuff and uh, you're going to, again, make enemies. If you exploit your passions, you're going to get a big thrill but it doesn't last. When you begin to get older, you realize, well, that was fun while we had it, but I haven't really learned very much from it. And uh, now what? Same with speech. Uh, nothing is more confusing to the mind than taking words too seriously. We've seen so many examples of that. And finally, to get intoxicated or narcotized, a narcotic is uh, anything like alcohol or opium which makes you sleepy. The word narcosis in, in Greek means uh, narx is sleep. So if you want to pass your life seeing things through a dim haze, this is not exactly awakening. <laughs> so then, uh, that's a concern so much for the conduct side of Buddhism. You know how people are when they get spiritually proud. They belong to some kind of a church group or an occult group and say, we are the ones who have, of course, the right teaching. We're the in-group, we are the elect, and everybody else outside is uh, really off the track. But then comes along someone who one-ups them by saying, well, in our circles, we are very tolerant, and we accept all religions and all ways as leading to the one. But what they're doing is they're playing the game called we are more tolerant than you are. You see, and in this way, the egocentric being is always in his own trap. So Buddha saw that all his yoga exercises and ascetic disciplines had just been ways of trying to get himself out of the trap in order to save his own skin, in order to find peace for himself. And he realized that that is an impossible thing to do because the motivation ruins the project. He found out then, you see, that there was no trap to get out of except himself. Trap and trapped are one. And when you understand that, there isn't any trap left. I'm going to explain that, of course, more carefully. So, as a result of this experience, he formulated what he calls the Dharma. That is the Sanskrit word for method. 
you will get a certain confusion when you read books on Buddhism because they switch between Sanskrit and Pali words. The earliest Buddhist scriptures that we know of are written in the Pali language and Pali is a softened form of Sanskrit. So that, for example, whereas the doctrine of the Buddha is called in Sanskrit the Dharma, but in Pali and in many books of Buddhism you'll find the Buddha's doctrine described as the Dhamma. And so in the same way Karma in Sanskrit becomes in Pali Kama. Buddha remains the same. The Dharma then is the method. Now the method of Buddhism, and this is absolutely important to remember, is dialectic. That is to say, it doesn't teach a doctrine. You cannot find anywhere what Buddhism teaches, as you can find out what Christianity or Judaism or Islam teaches. Because all Buddhism is a discourse. And what most people suppose to be its teachings are only the opening stages of the dialogue. So the concern of Buddha as a young man, the problem he wanted to solve was the problem of human suffering. And so he formulated his teaching in a very easy way to remember. Uh, all those Buddhist scriptures are full of what you might call mnemonic tricks, numbering things in such a way that they're easy to remember. And so he proposed, he summed up his teaching in the form of what are called the Four Noble Truths. And the first one, which because it was his main concern, was the truth about dukkha. Dukkha, suffering, pain, frustration, chronic dis-ease. It is the opposite of sukha, which means sweet, pleasure, etc. So, insofar as the problem posed in Buddhism is dukkha, I don't want to suffer, and I want to find someone or something that can cure me of suffering. That's the problem. Now, then if there's a person who solved the problem, a Buddha, people come to him and say, Master, how do we get out of this problem? So what he does is to propose certain things to them. First of all, he points out that with dukkha go two other things. These are respectively called anitya, anitya, and anatman. Anitya means a. Nitya, nitya means permanent. So impermanence, flux, change, is characteristic of everything whatsoever. There isn't anything at all in the whole world, in the material world, in the psychic world, in the spiritual world, there is nothing you can catch hold of and hang on to for safety. Nothing. Not only is there nothing you can hang on to, but by the teaching of Anatman, there is no you to hang on to it. In other words, all clinging to life is an illusory hand grasping at smoke. If you can get that into your head and see that that is so, Nobody needs to tell you that you ought not to grasp. Because you see, you can't. 
See, Buddhism is not essentially moralistic. The moralist is the person who tells people that they ought to be unselfish when they still feel like egos. And his efforts are always and invariably futile. Because what happens is he simply sweeps the dust under the carpet and uh, comes back again somehow. But in this case, it involves a complete realization that this is the case. So that's what the teacher puts across to begin with. The self is also known in Sanskrit as Brahman. This is a neuter word. Brahman is from the root brh, br, which means to expand, to grow. It isn't quite clear exactly why this word was chosen. Sometimes there's a still better word for uh, the self, which I like, is the word tat, almost like tit for tat. Tat means that. We get our word that from the Sanskrit tat. And so when the baby comes into being, first of all, the first thing it says is da. Da. Uh, the baby is pointing. Da. 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 And it's saying that. Look, isn't that marvelous? That. You see? So that is the witch than which there is no witcher. And so you get the formula in this uh, Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Tat Tvam Asi, which means Tat, that, Tuam, Latin, you know, uh, you, Asi, are. You are that, or that thou art. That art thou. So, in this sense, then, every self is modeled on and is an expression of the one self because you all feel individually that you're the center of the world and everything else is seen in circles circling out, sphering out from where you are and that's as it were the, called the microcosm the little cosmos but then in the same way the macrocosm has a central self, although this is not central, in the way we talk about centers in space. Do you see that? Uh, a center of a circle is in the middle of the circle, and the circumference is away from it. But you could say, you could use a phrase that the Christian theologians have used of God, that circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. You could speak of Brahman that way. It isn't in the middle of the universe, spatially speaking. You might ask the question, where is the universe? Ever thought of that one? Where is it? Well, you can't say where because all, everywhere has to be in relation to something. There would have to be another universe to say where this one is. But then since those two together would constitute the universe, uh, we wouldn't still be able to say where it was. It isn't anywhere. And so in that sense, the center isn't anywhere in space, locally. And furthermore, the kind of space we are dealing with is only one possible kind of space. It's the kind of space our physical organisms are attuned to. We are, you see, like the radio. We pick up what wavelength we're on. So then, when inquirers used to come to that great modern Hindu saint, Sri Ramana Maharshi, and they'd ask him all sorts of silly questions, like, who was I in my last incarnation? What will I be in my next one? He would always reply, who is asking the question? Who are you? Find out, because that's the thing you need to know. 
as it were, dig down into the depths of your being and say, what is this that I call I? That's one of the very fascinating questions. It's also, it teases us out of thought to think about death in the sense of going to sleep and never waking up. Imagine that. And you find you can't. And yet, it's, it's, a, it's a thought that although you can't get to grips with it, it remains fascinating. Also the question, how is it suddenly that you awakened into this world? Where were you before? In Zen Buddhism, they have the meditation problem, the koan. Before your father and mother conceived you, what is your original nature? And that's the same sort of weird question as what it would be like to go to sleep and never wake up. What was it like to wake up having not previously gone to sleep? It's very mysterious. But as you go on and plumb this question, you begin to develop the feeling that your existence is exceedingly odd. In many ways odd. Odd because it is here and it so easily might not have been. After all, if your father hadn't met your mother, would you be here? Now, of course, somebody would be here because he might have met somebody else. <laughs> would that be you? Of course it would. Don't you see? You can only be you by being someone. But every someone is you. Every someone is I. That's your name, you say. Uh, it's me. I am here. And everybody feels that I in the same way. It's the same feeling. Just like blue everywhere is the same color. So I-ness being, as it were, the most fundamental thing in man is also fundamental to the universe. It too is I. And our I is a special case of it. Coming out from the, in quotes, central eye, like so many tits from the belly of a sow, or so many spines from a sea urchin, so many legs from a spider. And that is, of course, why the images of the Hindu gods are shown with many arms or many faces, because it is saying that all arms are the arms of the divinity, all faces are its masks. So, you see, there's really nothing to worry about. Because the, the, the important you is perfectly indestructible. It's what there is. Our comings and goings, our fortunes and misfortunes are a sort of mirage. The more we know about them, the more we know about the world, the more diaphanous it seems. And therefore, everything in the world has the characteristics of smoke. You know, when you blow a cigarette or pipe or something and a cloud of smoke and you see it in the sunbeam and it's full of walls and designs and all kinds of marvelous things going on and then slowly it disappears. Well, everything's just like that. Now, there are two attitudes you can take to that state of affairs. You can say sour grapes. It's all a lousy, wretched trap. And I, here I am, and I'm given all these feelings of love and attachment and joy of life, and then I fall apart. My teeth <laughs> drop out. My eyes become feeble. I get cancer or cirrhosis of the liver or something, and then it all falls apart, and it's too bad. Therefore, therefore, don't become attached to things. Don't enjoy life. Treat it, holding it off like that, just like a very, very firm person who's been jilted and says, never again will I get mixed up with love, because love hurts. But on the other hand, a weaving of smoke, 
can be very beautiful. Provided you don't lean on it. Provided you don't try to preserve it. Catch hold of it. Then you destroy it. So exactly the same way. There's nothing in the way of form that you can lean on, that you can grasp. And if you see that, then the world of form is very beautiful. If you let it go, to love people, you see, if you're a husband and wife, you, you must let each other go. Otherwise, the marriage is either going to break up or it's going to be hell. If you love a person, you say to that person, look, I love you, whatever that may be. I've seen quite a bit of it, and I know there's lots that I haven't seen. But still, it's you, and I want you to be what you want to be. And I won't be happy if I've got you in a cage. You'll be a bird without song. And they're likely to go on loving each other. But if they wrap each other up with all sorts of ties and chains and documents and things, then uh, they are not on a very safe basis. The very firm words of those documents belie the situation, because nobody curses and swears and kisses the Bible and all sorts of things like that if he means yes. If there's some doubt that he means yes, then he's asked to make all these rituals of cursing and swearing, and signing on dotted lines and putting the seal and something. Indicates doubt right at once. It, it just does fly in the argument <coughs> from the beginning. So then, Here's the drama. My metaphysics, let me be perfectly frank with you, are that there is the central self. You can call it God. You can call it anything you like. And it's all of us. It's playing all the parts of all beings whatsoever, everywhere and anywhere. And it's playing the game of hide and seek with itself. It gets lost, it gets involved in the farthest out adventures, but in the end, it always wakes up and comes back to itself. And when you are ready to wake up, you're going to wake up. And if you're not ready, you're going to stay pretending that you're just a little, poor little me. And uh, since you're all here and engaged in this sort of inquiry and listening to this sort of lecture, I assume that you're all on the process of waking up. Or else you're teasing yourselves with some kind of uh, flirtation with waking up, which you're not serious about. But I assume yeah, maybe you are not serious but sincere, that you are ready to wake up. So then, when you're in the way of waking up and finding out who you really are, you meet a character called a guru. As the Hindus say, this word, the teacher, the awakener. And what is the function of a guru? He's the man who looks at you in the eye and says, oh, come off it. <laughs> I know who you are. You know, you come to the guru and say, sir, I have a problem. I'm unhappy and I want to get one up on the universe or I want to become enlightened. I want spiritual wisdom. Ah, and the guru looks at you and says, Who are you? You know Sri Ramana Maharshi, that great Hindu sage of modern times? People used to come to him and say, Master, who was I in my last incarnation? As if that mattered. And he would say, Who is asking the question? And he'd look at you and say, Basically, go right down to it. You're looking at me, you're looking out, and you're unaware of what's behind your eyes. Go back in and find out who you are, where the question comes from, why you ask. And if you've looked at a photograph of that man, I have a gorgeous photograph of him, and you look in those, I walk by it every time I go out of the front door, and I look at those eyes and the humor in them, the lilting laugh that says, Oh, come off it, man. <laughs> Shiva, I recognize you. When you come to my door and you say, I'm so-and-so, I say, ha-ha, what a funny way God has come on today. <laughs> uh, there are all sorts of tricks, of course, that gurus play. They uh, say, well... We're going to put you through the mill. 
And the reason they do that is simply that you won't wake up until you feel you've paid a price for it. In other words, the sense of guilt that one has, or the sense of anxiety, is simply the way one experiences keeping the game of disguise going on. Do you see that? Supposing you say, I feel guilty. Christianity makes you feel guilty for existing. That somehow, the very fact that you exist is an affront. You are a fallen human being. I remember as a child when we went to the services of the church on Good Friday, they gave us each a colored postcard with Jesus crucified on it. And it said underneath, this have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You know, you felt awful. You have nailed that man to the cross. Because you eat steak, you have crucified Christ. Because you kill the bull, and after all, you depend on it. Mithra, it's the same mystery. And what are you going to do about that? This have I done for thee, what doest thou for me? You feel awful that you just exist at all. But that sense, that sense of guilt is the veil across the sanctuary. Don't you dare come in. In order to, you know, in all mysteries, when you're going to be initiated, there's somebody saying, ah, 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 don't you come in. You've got to fulfill this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, and this requirement, then we'll let you in. And so you go, you, you go through the mill. Why? Because this is, you are saying to yourself, I won't wake up until I feel I deserve it. I won't wake up until I've made it difficult for me to wake up. So I, I, I invent for myself an elaborate system of delaying my waking up. I put myself through this test and that test, and when I feel it's been sufficiently arduous, then I may at last admit to myself who I really am and draw aside the veil and realize that after all, when all is said and done, I am that I am, which is the name of God. And when it comes to it, that's really rather funny. They say in Zen, when you attain Satori, nothing is left to you at that moment but to have a good laugh. But naturally, uh, all masters, Zen masters, yoga masters, every kind of master, uh, puts up a barrier and says to you, He simply plays your own game. You know, we say anybody who goes to a psychiatrist ought to have his head examined. Because you, when you go to a psychiatrist, you define yourself as somebody who ought to have his head examined. Same way, uh, the Zen masters say anybody who studies Zen or comes to a Zen master ought to be given 30 blows with a stick. Because he was stupid enough to pose the question that he had a problem. But you're the problem. You, you put yourself in this situation. So it's a question fundamentally. Do you define yourself as a victim of the world or as the world? You can define yourself. You see, if you identify you with what you call the voluntary system of the nerves, and say, only that's me. And that's really a rather limited amount of my total performance, what I do voluntarily. Then you've defined yourself as the victim in the game. And so you are able to feel that life was a trap. Something else, whether it was God or whether it was fate or whether it was uh, the big mechanism, the system, imposed this on you. And you can say, poor little me. 
But you can equally well, and with just as much justification, define yourself not only as what you do voluntarily, but also what you do involuntarily. That's you too. Do you beat your heart or don't you? Or does it just happen to you? And if you define yourself as the works, then nobody's imposing on you. You're not a victim. You're doing it. Because you can't explain how you do it in words, because words are too clumsy. And it takes too long to say. You get bored with it. But actually, then you can say, with, with gusto, I am responsible for this life. Whether comedy or tragedy, I did it. And it seems to me that that is a basis for behavior and going on, which is more fundamentally joyous and profitable and uh, great than defining ourselves as miserable victims or sinners or what have you. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the Nature of Consciousness Lecture Series. So this was Eno's principle. As I said, he died in 715, and he left five very great disciples who taught substantially the same sort of thing. But as things go, then these disciples had disciples, and those disciples had disciples, and there's a genealogy. And Zen broke into what are called five houses. And these, uh, some of them didn't go on. Zen went on in two main forms. One is called, by the Japanese, Rinzai Zen, after the great master Rinzai, who lived towards the end of the ninth century. And the Soto school comes from another line, and they have a slightly different emphasis. Soto is more serene in its approach, Rinzai more gutsy. Uh, Rinzai people use the koan method in Zen study, Soto people don't, at least not in the same way. But this period between the death of the sixth patriarch, Eno, and about the year 1000 is the golden age of Zen. This, these were the really formative years. And after that, Zen began to decline in China. It became mixed up with other forms of Buddhism, and it suffered the fate of many, many forms of meditation type or yoga type discipline, it got a little bit sidetracked into occult and psychic matters, what are called in Buddhism Siddhi, or the development of supernormal powers. For Zen, this is completely beside the point. But it got involved with Chinese alchemy with Taoistic alchemy and all sorts of foolishness in that direction. But a very strong strain of Zen went to Japan, the first being in about 1130, the monk Eisai, and then about 1200, the monk I told you about, Dogen, who founded the great beautiful, gorgeous, galoptious monastery at Eheji, which exists to this day. Now, in this golden age of Chinese Zen, the main method of study was walking Zen rather than sitting Zen. All monks were great travelers. And they walked for miles and miles through fields and mountains, visiting temples, to see if they could find a master who would 
cause their spark to flash. To get what is called in Mandarin, Wu, or in Japanese, Satori, or in Cantonese, Ng. <clears throat> this always rather fascinates me, the way this character is written. The word I in Chinese is sometimes represented by this right-hand side of the character alone. Five mouths, five senses. This one means your mind or heart, the heart-mind, Shin. Now when we say well, something very surprising happened, my heart came into my mouth. Here it comes into all five. So this character means awakening. It's the same in a way as the Sanskrit bodhi, awakening from the illusion of being a separate ego locked up in a bag of skin, discovering that you are the whole universe. And of course, if you do discover that, and you do see into it all of a sudden, it's a shock, because your whole common sense is turned directly inside out. Everything is the same as you've always seen it, but completely different. Because you know who you are. You know that, uh, what the devil were you worrying about? What was all that fuss? What was all that to do? Well, you see, it was part of the game. Everything from one point of view is fuss. And to do. To do, to do. What is there to do? <laughs> but when you wake up, you see, and discover that all this to do wasn't you, what you thought was you, but was the entire works, which we can just call it, that you're it, and it is it, and everything is it, and it does all things that are done, then that is a great surprise. But it sounds tasteless. Now, therefore, one asks the question, that sounds very interesting, but how do I recapture the baby point of view? And I showed that that was the wrong question, because it arises entirely and exclusively out of the adult point of view. Because the adult point of view involves the fiction that I exist as an agent independently of everything else that's going on. And so ask, how can I do this? And the important thing is to realize that the feeling of there being this isolated I is part of the game and it has no fundamental reality except as a convention. And so long as that isn't clear, we're confused. I reiterated the point that when we ask to whom must it become clear or to whom is it not clear, that this too was all part of the illusion of the world that the adult presents to the child. So the only way in which the child's vision can come again is in the realization that the I can't do anything about it at all and can't even do nothing about it. All possibilities of vision for what we call I myself are out. And this, and of course, is the same meaning that the Christian or the Islamic mystics would say, that the mystical experience is the gift of God, and there's nothing you can do to get it. That's a clumsy way, really, of saying the same thing. Because so long as you are trying, or not trying, 
you are aggravating the sensation of the separate ego. Now, that in itself, you see, as I talk about it, presents a certain difficulty. Or one thinks it's difficult. There would be a second difficulty if we were to go on and say, it isn't only the illusion of the ego, but the whole valuation system that we put on the complexity of vibrations we call awareness of life, all the various valuations that are put on this by the social game are maya, that is to say they are illusory, basically. Because it's only in play, as it were, that we say this is good and this is bad, this is advantageous, this is disadvantageous. And so we would go on to say after this, but I cannot imagine anything more difficult than overcoming that hypnosis. I am so enchanted by this system that the idea of treating it as not really very serious seems to me unthinkable. Of course, you have to think that. It's like a hypnotist working on somebody and saying, you are not going to remember any of this conversation after you come to. And so he's put the suggestion into you that you forget the whole thing. So in the same way, the suggestion has been put into all of us that these rules that we have learned are sacrosanct. And that we, they don't say you will not be able to think otherwise. They say they are true. They are the truth. You see? And that is the same function as the hypnotic suggestion put into us ever since we were receptive children. So naturally, it's all part of the conspiracy which we are playing on ourselves. We can't blame our parents for this because their parents played it on them. And they bought it. And don't forget that time goes backwards. You see? <laughs> you can't blame this on the past because now in the present you are creating the, value, the values of the past and you are buying them all along, you see? So there's no, no out on this. You see, in a way, psychoanalytically, one is given an out by saying, well, the parents didn't bring up their children properly. And American people are consumed with guilt about the way they, d they bring up their children. So we must abandon completely the notion of blaming the past for any kind of situation we're in and reverse our thinking and see that the past always flows back from the present, that now is the creative point of life. And so, you see, uh, it's, it's like the idea of forgiving somebody. Uh, you change the meaning of the past by doing that. It's like also the, when you watch the flow of music. The melody, as it is expressed, it is changed by notes that come later, just as the meaning of a sentence, especially, say, take German or Latin, where there's the convention of placing a verb at the end of a sentence. You wait, in other words, till later to find out what the sentence means, according to our way of feeling it. So it is also in our language, if I say I love you, you don't know when I've said I, what I is doing. I could say I hate you. So we don't know until later. So in other words, the word love or the word hate changes the function of the word I. And then I was going to say, I love flowers. No, but I love you, you see? And so the word later changes the meaning of those that go before. 
The present is always changing the past. So, when you get the idea in your mind that the point of view I'm talking about is very difficult indeed to acquire, that idea is one you are putting there to stop yourself seeing the other point of view. And above all, you must not take that seriously. It is simply a method of postponing seeing the point now. So you have to see it now or never, because there is only now. If you say, well, tomorrow, the next day, maybe in another dozen lifetimes, I'll be ready. That means, simply and solely, I don't want to be bothered with it now. I'm even not interested in it now, so I've got an excuse for putting it off. Which is fine, that's perfectly okay. <laughs> you can put it off. There is no reason, there is no compulsion why you should come out of this illusion. That's why Oriental people do not tend, in the same way as Westerners, to be missionaries. And saying it's very urgent that you be saved. It isn't, unless you say so. I mean, unless you are so disturbed by the suffering and the problem of suffering that you've got to find some sort of escape. But if you don't want to, you can stay there. It's okay, there's lots of time. And maybe you'll see through it when you die. At least in the moment of death, <laughs> you'll see that it was all a fake. So, don't be scared about the idea of the difficulty of it. That's a red herring and it's quite irrelevant. And I don't think that teachers should talk quite so much about this as they do and saying oh this is going to take a long long time and a lot of practice and many years maybe it will maybe it won't but that's beside the point because it distracts it's like telling somebody that this is a very difficult book to read and it requires immense powers of concentration well that immediately kills your interest in it Instead of if I would say, well, now this is a book, most extraordinary book. It's just so fascinating. I've been working on it for years. And every time I, do, I, get, I just get so involved, I can't drop the thing. Huh? I mean, that's a far more encouraging attitude to a student than, uh, well, it's going to be very difficult. Except to very, very self-hating students who uh, somehow perversely enjoy suffering through it. I suppose that's, uh, of course, a way too, but... All right, now... Here is the point. If you believe... If you have certain propositions that you want to assert about the ultimate reality, or what Paul Tillich calls the ultimate ground of being, You're talking nonsense. Because you can't say something specific about everything. You see, supposing you wanted to say God has a shape. But if God is all that there is, then God doesn't have any outside, so he can't have a shape. You have to have an outside and space outside it to have a shape. So uh, that's why the Hebrews, too, are against people making images of God. But uh, nonetheless, Jews and Christians persistently make images of God, uh, not necessarily in pictures and statues, but they make images in their minds. And those are much more insidious images. Buddhism is not saying that the self, capital S, 
the great Atman, or what not. It isn't denying that the experience which corresponds to these words is realizable. What it is saying is that if you make conceptions and doctrines about these things, you are liable to become attached to them. You are liable to start believing instead of knowing. So they say in Zen Buddhism, the doctrine of Buddhism is a finger pointing at the moon. Do not mistake the finger for the moon. Also, we might say in the West, the idea of God is a finger pointing at God. But what most people do is instead of following the finger, they suck it for comfort. <laughs> and so Buddha chopped off the finger. And uh, undermined all metaphysical beliefs. There are many, many dialogues in the Pali scriptures where people try to corner the Buddha into a metaphysical position. Is the world eternal? The Buddha says nothing. Is the world not eternal? And he answers nothing. Is the world both eternal and not eternal? And he don't say nothing. Is the world neither eternal nor not eternal? And still he don't say nothing. He maintains what is called the noble silence. Sometimes later called the thunderous silence. Because this silence, this metaphysical silence, is not a void. It is very powerful. The silence is the open window through which you can see. Not concepts, not ideas, not beliefs, but the very goods. But if you say what it is that you see, you erect an image and an idol and you misdirect people. It's better to destroy people's beliefs than to give them beliefs. I know it hurts, but it is the way. That is what cracks the eggshell and lets out the chick. Of course, if you want to stay in the eggshell, you can, but you'll get addled. <laughs> This, then, you see, is why Buddhism is in dialogue form. The truth cannot be told. It can be suggested, it can be indicated. And a method of interchange between teacher and student can be arranged, whereby the teacher constantly pricks the student's bubbles. And that's what it's all about. And because that's the way it is, we find that in the course of history, Buddhism keeps changing. It develops, it grows. As people make all these explorations that the original Buddha suggested, they find out all kinds of new things. They explore the mind, they find out all the tricks of the mind. They, uh, oh, they find out ever so many things. And they begin to teach these things, talk about them. And some people, influenced by, in modern Asia, influenced by Protestantism, say, let's go back to the simple original teachings of the Buddha. See, like people say, let's get back to the simple teachings of Jesus. Well, the simple teachings of Jesus are as lost as lost can get. Nobody can read the New Testament with a clean mind today. Because whenever you look at the Bible, don't you hear some preacher's voice in your childhood reading those words? Hasn't your culture taught you to interpret these words in certain ways? You can't get back. And nobody can get back to Buddha. You can only go on to Buddha. So that's why in Zen they just burn the books up. <laughs> I mean occasionally. <laughs> because to burn up books you've got to have some books to burn up. <laughs> But when, uh, you know, you can say that the, the teaching of the founder is the thing. This is terrible. It's like the oak suddenly saying one day, hey, we ought to have all these leaves around here. We ought to be just that simple little acorn. <laughs> <laughs> now, a living tradition grows. And but what it does is this. As it grows, say it grew from a seed, 
an acorn keeps dropping off new acorns. You don't go back to the old acorn, you get a new one. And that becomes a new seed for another tree. This is fine. Now, let me just warn you. The scholarly study of Buddhism is a magnum opus beyond belief. There are two collections of Buddhist canonical scriptures. One is in Pali. The other was originally in Sanskrit, but we don't have a complete collection of it in Sanskrit. We have these collections in Tibetan and Chinese. Bigger than the Encyclopedia Britannica, as a matter of fact. So it's a formidable enterprise to get into the Buddhist scriptures, and what's more, most of them are unbelievably boring. They were written by monks with plenty of time to pass on wet afternoons during the monsoon. And uh, they repeat and they elaborate and they are full of kind of preparatory. You know how in the silly trick in radio they have of giving a fanfare to introduce the program. So in the same way, these scriptures have fanfares in which all sorts of Buddhas are introduced and we beings and they're all described and where they were assembled and how many of them there were and where they were sitting and what kind of bows they made and all this jazz. And then uh, <laughs> finally a few pearls of wisdom are dropped by the Buddha or else they sometimes go on for pages and pages of actually very, very subtle and very profound discourse that is not dull if you have a penchant for that kind of thing. But uh, I warn you, don't try too hard to read the Buddhist scriptures. It's all right to read the Dhammapada, which are sayings of the Buddha. It's all right to read the Diamond Sutra. It's all right even to read the Surangama Sutra or the Lankavatara. But when you get mixed up with the larger Pragna Paramita and all those things, you're in deep water. So you see from time to time, Buddhists get tired of the scriptures. Actually, they keep them in a revolving bookcase in some monasteries. Think about so high, so wide, it revolves. And uh, instead of reading all this stuff, you're supposed to be able to acquire as much merit as you would from reading it all by twirling the bookcase around once. <laughs> In uh, <laughs> Zen monasteries, they have an annual ceremony for reading the scriptures, but they are printed like an uh, accordion. In other words, the pages are connected to each other zigzag. And then they have board on the back and the front, so that you can pick one up and go like that, you know, like a slinky uh, moves. <laughs> and so they, each monk is assigned a pile of the volumes. This happens once a year. And they all chant uh, sections of the scripture, but very often each monk chants a different one. And while they're doing this, they pick up a volume and go click and put it down on the other side. Pick up the next one, click. And this is the annual reading of the scriptures. <laughs> <laughs> There's a wonderful picture of this being done in Suzuki's book, The Training of a Zen Buddhist Monk. So you see, uh, I'm a Buddhist uh, are funny about scriptures. They, they don't treat them the way Christians treat the Bible. They respect them. They occasionally read them, but uh, they feel that the writing, the written word, is purely incidental. It is not the point. And indeed, it can be a very serious obstacle. Zhuangzi, a Taoist sage, once said, just as a dog is not considered a good dog just for being a good barker, a man is not considered a good man just for being a good talker. So uh, we have to watch out for the traps of words.
Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the World as Emptiness lecture series. You are a fluke. You are a separate event. And you run from the maternity ward to the crematorium, and that's it, baby. That's it. Now, why does anybody think that way? There's no reason to, because it isn't even scientific. It's just a myth. And it's invented by people who wanted to feel a certain way. They want to play a certain game. See, the game of God begot in, got embarrassing. The, the idea of God as the potter, the architect of the universe, is, is, is good. and It makes you feel that life is, after all, important. There is someone who cares. It has meaning. It has sense. And you are valuable in the eyes of the Father. But after a while, it gets embarrassing. And you realize that everything you do is being watched by God. <laughs> he knows your tiniest, inmost feelings and thoughts. And you say after a while, quit bugging me. <laughs> I don't want you around. So you become an atheist. Just to get rid of it. Then, then you feel terrible after that because you got rid of God. But that means you got rid of yourself. You're just nothing but a machine. And your idea that you're a machine is just a machine, too. So if you're a smart kid, you commit suicide. <laughs> Camus said there is only really one serious philosophical question, which is whether or not to commit suicide. I think there are four or five serious philosophical <laughs> questions. The first one is, who started it? The second is, are we going to make it? The third is, where are we going to put it? The fourth is, who's going to clean up? <laughs> and the fifth, is it serious? <laughs> but, but still, uh, should you or not commit suicide? This is a good question. Why go on? And you only go on if the game is worth the candle. Now, the universe has been going on for an incredible long time. And so, really, a, a satisfactory theory of the universe has to be one that's worth betting on. That's a very, it seems to me, absolutely elementary common sense. If you make a theory of the universe which isn't worth betting on, why bother? Just commit suicide. But if you want to go on playing the game, you've got to have an optimal theory for playing the game. Otherwise, there's no point in it. But the people who coined the fully automatic theory of the universe were playing a very funny game. What they wanted to say was this, all you people who believe in religion are old ladies and wishful thinkers. You've got a big daddy up there and you want a comfort and thing, but life is rough. Life is tough and uh, success goes to the most hard-headed people. That was a very convenient theory when the European-American world was colonizing the natives everywhere else. He said, we are the end product of evolution, and uh, we are tough, see. I'm a big, strong guy because I face facts, and life is just a bunch of junk, and I'm going to impose my will on it and turn it into something else, you see. And I'm real hard. See, that's a way of flattering yourself. And so uh, it has become academically plausible and fashionable that this is the way the world works. In academic circles, no other theory of the world than the fully automatic model is respectable. Because if you're an academic person, you've got to be an intellectually tough person. You've got to be prickly. See, there are basically two kinds of philosophy. One's called prickles, the other's called goo. <laughs> and uh, prickly people are precise, rigorous, logical. They like everything chopped up and clear. Goo people like it vague, 
Uh, for example, in physics, prickly people believe that the ultimate constituents of matter are particles. Goo people believe it's waves. <laughs> and uh, in, in uh, <coughs> philosophy, prickly people are logical positivists and goo people are idealists. And they're always arguing with each other. And what they don't realize is that they, neither one can take his position without the other person. Because you wouldn't know you advocated prickles unless there was somebody else advocating goo. <laughs> you wouldn't know what a prickle was unless you knew what goo was. Because life is not either prickles or goo. It's gooey prickles and prickly goo. <laughs> and they go together, like back and front, male and female. And that's the answer to philosophy. See, I'm a philosopher. And I'm not going to argue very much, because if you don't argue with me, I don't know what I think. <laughs> so if we argue, I say thank you. Because uh, going to the courtesy of your taking a different point of view, I understand what I mean. So I can't get rid of you. But however, you see, this whole idea that the universe is just nothing at all but unintelligent force playing around and not even enjoying it is a put-down theory of the world. People who had a, an advantage to make a game to play by putting it down and making out that because they put the world down, they were a superior kind of people. So uh, that just won't do. Uh, we've had it, because if, if you seriously go along with this idea of the world, you are what is technically called alienated. You feel hostile to the world. You feel that the world is a trap. It is a, a mechanism, it's electronic and neurological uh, mechanisms into which you somehow got caught. And you, poor thing, have to put up with being in a body that's falling apart and uh, that gets cancer, that gets uh, uh, the great Siberian itch, and uh, it's just terrible. And these mechanics, doctors, are trying to help you out, but they really can't succeed in the end. And you're just going to fall apart, and it's a grim business, and it's too bad. So if you think that that's the way things are, you may as well commit suicide right now. <laughs> Unless you say, well, I don't, because there really, after all, there might be eternal damnation <coughs> in the back of the thing if I did that. Or uh, then I identify with my children or something, and I think of them going on and without me and uh, nobody to support them. But of course, if I do go on in this frame of mind and continue to support them, I shall merely teach them to be like I am. And they'll go on dragging it out to support their children, and they won't enjoy it and they'll be afraid to commit suicide, and so will their children. They all learn the same lesson. I love the story of a conversation at an English country house at a dinner party, where the hostess started up the question of death and asked the various guests what they thought was going to happen to them when they die. And some thought about reincarnation, and others thought about various kinds of... Uh, uh, different planes of being, and others thought they were going to be annihilated. But all, n none of the guests had answered except Sir Roderick, who was a kind of a military type, but a very devout pillar of the Church of England. He was the church warden, chief of the vestry in the local country parish. And the lady said, Sir Roderick, you haven't said a word. What do you think is going to happen to you when you die? Oh, he said, I am perfectly certain that I shall go to heaven and enjoy everlasting bliss, but I wish you wouldn't indulge in such a depressing conversation. <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Uh, death in the Western world is a real problem. We hush it up. We pretend it hasn't happened. Our morticians, who are very smart commercial operators, <laughs> know exactly what's expected of them. And they 
make death just awful by pretending it doesn't happen. See what happens. You go to a hospital <coughs> and you're at the end. You've got terminal cancer. And all your friends come around and they wear false smiles and they say, cheer up, you'll be all right. <laughs> uh, in a few days from now, you'll be back home and we'll, uh, we'll go out for a picnic again. The doctors have their bedside man. You see, a doctor is absolutely helpless with a terminal case because he's a, a doctor is, by social definition, a healer. And he's not allowed to help you die. He's out of role. Even though, I mean, he may sneak behind the rules and do it, but, but he's definitely, he's got to heal you. So he's going to keep you indefinitely on the end of tubes and all kinds of things. <laughs> While there's a certain grave demeanor to all this, and all the nurses are so pleasant and so totally distant, because they know this is death. And they may be frank with you. That's why they feel distant. It's not that they're not concerned. It's not that they're heartless people, but that they just don't know how to be frank, like lots of people when they meet a drunk, they don't know what to do with a drunk. Uh, because uh, he's, not, he's not, behaving, not behaving right. And so, <laughs> when you're dying, you're not behaving right, you're supposed to live. <laughs> See, so we don't know what to do with a dying person. We don't get around that person and say, listen now, listen man, listen, I've got the news for you, you're going to die. <laughs> and this is going to be great. <laughs> Look, no more responsibilities. Don't have to pay those bills anymore. <laughs> Don't have to worry about anything. You're going to just die. And let's go out with a bang. <laughs> let's have a party, see? We'll, 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 we'll put some, uh, some of that morphine in you so that you won't hurt too much. But we we're going to prop you up in bed and we're going to bring all our friends around and we're going to have champagne. And you're going you're gonna to die at the end of it, see? <laughs> and it's going to be just marvelous. Just like being born, see? They, when we had birth problems, see? All women used to think that birth had to be painful. It was good for them. It was one of the things you had to suffer because you'd been, you'd been screwing around with people and therefore you, <laughs> you, you had to have a child and it's got to hurt. And uh, then the doctors got together and they scratched their heads and the man called Grantley Dick Reed said no. Birth doesn't hurt, it's natural. You know, all you've got to do is to talk these women into the idea that it doesn't hurt, that all these so-called pains are just tensions. And that uh, birth is great. It's not a disease. It's not really something you ought to go to hospital for. Because you associate hospitals with diseases and sickness. Birth isn't sickness. All right, now let's do some new thinking. What about death? Is death sickness? Or is it a healthy, natural event like being born? Of course it is. So, I mean, a, a little change in social attitude about this will fortify everybody else. I mean, I'm, if I'm alone and all my relatives are going, mmm, and kind of <laughs> pretending to me, it's going to be hard for me. I've got to challenge the whole bunch of them and get my dander up and say, listen, damn you, I don't want all this thing around here. You've got to take a different attitude about my death. Well, that's hard. But if everybody helps me, and we do, we're all one body. They all come around and say, congratulations, you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Liberation. Liberation now, you see. Because just before you die, I mean, look, I know very well a skillful priest handling a person dying can do this for them. But he has to talk very, very, very straight. And he has to say, listen, these doctors, uh, you don't, don't you pay any attention to them. They're trying to amuse you and deceive you. You're going to die. This isn't terrible. But it's just going to be the end of you as a system of memories. And so you've got a great chance right now before it happens to let go of everything. Because you know it's going to go and it is going to help you. It's going to help you let go of everything. So if you have any possessions left, give them away. Give everything away. And uh, if you have anything to say that is, you felt that you ought to say before you die and that you're kind of hanging on to and it's bothering you, say it. I mean, I don't mean necessarily a last confession, but say it said that Adlai Stevenson, shortly before he died, said that uh, 
he had been making a monkey of himself because he didn't agree with the government's policy about something or other. You know, he had to get that off his chest because he had a little thought in the back of his mind that things were catching up with him, you see? So the moment comes when this thing called death has to be taken completely, not as some ghastly accident, something that uh, all your friends are going to stay away because you're awful. I mean, sometimes people, when they die, are in a very unpleasant physical condition. They don't smell good, they don't look good, uh, and so on. But an enormous amount can be done with scientific methods to make things reasonably tidy from a purely sensory point of view. But the main thing is the attitude that death is as positive as birth and should be a matter for rejoicing because death is the symbol of the liberation. There is a wonderful saying that Ananda Kumaraswamy used to quote. I pray that death will not come and find me still unannihilate. In other words, that man dies happy if there is no one to die. In other words, if the ego has disappeared before death caught up with it. But you see, the knowledge of death helps the ego to disappear because it tells you you can't hang on. So what we need, uh, if, if we're going to have a, a good religion around, that's one of the places where it can start. Having, I don't know, well, nowadays I suppose they'd call it the institution for creative dying. <laughs> <laughs> but something like that. And uh, you can have, you can have, uh, one department where you can have champagne cocktail party to die with, another department where you can have glorious religious rituals and priests and things like that, another department where you can have uh, psychedelic drugs, another department where you can have uh, special kinds of music, uh, anything, you know. All, all, all these arrangements will be provided for in a hospital for uh, delightful dying. Uh, but that's the thing, to go out with a bang instead of a whimper. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the World as Emptiness lecture series. Back in 1958, I was in Zurich, and there met a most extraordinary man by the name of Karl Fried von Dürkheim. He was a former German diplomat who had studied Zen in Japan. And when he came back after the war, he opened a meditation school and retreat in the Black Forest. And he said, well, I tell you what, a lot of my work has to do with people who went through spiritual crises during the war. And he said, you know, uh, we, we all know that when a person's in an absolutely extreme situation and they accept it, there is a possibility of a natural satori. And that's what I mean when I was explaining that when one gets to an extreme, that is to say, to the point where you realize that there is nothing you can do about life, nothing you can not do about life, then you're the mosquito biting the iron bull. Well, so in the same way, he said, look, you heard a bomb coming at you. You could hear it whistle, and you knew it was right above you and headed straight at you, and that you were finished, and you accepted it. And suddenly, there was a strange feeling that everything is absolutely clear. You suddenly see that there isn't a grain of dust in the whole universe that's in the wrong place. That you understand completely, absolutely, totally, what it's all about. Because you can't say what it is. But he said, in so many cases, the bomb was a dud, and they lived to tell the tale. 
Or he said you were in a concentration camp. You've been there so long that you gave up all hope whatsoever, ever getting out. You were just going through this miserable, boring, degrading grind, week after week after week. Nobody paid the slightest attention to you as an individual. You knew you would never get out, and you accepted it. And suddenly, something changed. This extraordinary feeling of freedom. Or he said, you were a displaced refugee. You had lost your family. You didn't know whether they even existed. You were miles from your home. You didn't know whether it existed. You had lost your job, your very identity. You were absolutely nowhere, and you accepted it. And suddenly, you were as light as a feather and free as the air. Now, he said, so many people have had those experiences, and they talk about them to their families and friends, and they say, oh, well, you were under terrific pressure, and you probably had some hallucination, you know? Well, he said, I am showing those people that so far from having a hallucination, those were the few, few occasions in which they woke up. So, you see, this is always the opportunity presented by death. That if one can go into death with eyes open and have somebody help you, if necessary, to give up before you die. This extraordinary thing can happen to you. So that from your standpoint, in that position, at that time, you would say, I wouldn't have missed that opportunity for the world. Now I understand why we die. The reason we die is to give us the opportunity to understand what life's all about. By letting go. Because then we come to a situation that the ego can't deal with. When we are no longer hypnotized by that, then our natural consciousness can see clearly what all this universe is for. So, therefore, we have missed this golden opportunity by institutionalizing death out of the way instead of having a socially understood acceptance of death and rejoicing in death. Now, I could imagine that uh, one person would want to rejoice in death in an entirely different way from another. Like, um, say, a wedding is a rite of passage. Uh, there are certainly some forms of celebrating a wedding which I would find a total bore and quite offensive. Other ways would be very good. I would enjoy it. So everybody, in other words, I'm not saying that you've got to get mixed up with a lot of people coming, laughing around you and giving you presents and cards and everything because you're going to die. <laughs> but I'm only indicating a general thing, that the doctor, the, the, the ministers, the psychiatrists, and above all, us, really owe it to our friends to work out an entirely new approach to death. Because what has happened, you see, from earliest childhood, the child learned that great uncle was dying and saw the family put on long faces and say, oh, that's too bad. Even Christians who think they're going to go to heaven, you know, they get absolutely morbid, more so than anybody else about death, because heaven, as they all know, is a very boring place. <laughs> and <laughs> so this frightful thing, oh, he's dead. No one understands that for the living to lose someone you love or even for a dying person to worry about what on earth my wife, my children, my whatever are going to do without me. One can understand a certain worry in that. But nobody is indispensable. And there comes a point when you have to say, I'm sorry, but 
I am completely going to abandon responsibility for anything. Because there is no further way I can do it. This is another way of that surrender. And then the curious thing that occurs is the moment all that has dropped, suddenly it dawns on you. That to be important, existence does not have to go on any longer than a moment. Quantitative continuity is of no value. How long can you hold your breath? Who cares? <laughs> so, it follows from that, you see, that if any one of us, without being shocked into it by being bombed or put in a concentration camp, could at this moment be as one about to die, genuinely and honestly, we would understand the mystery of life. Because death is the, is it in a certain sense, the source of life. Just as we see in nature, when the leaves fall from the trees, they mold and rot, and this supplies humus from which more plants can grow. It's a cycle life. But in every way, symbolic and otherwise, human beings try to stop that cycle. Unamuno said, human beings are the only species that hoard their dead. And therefore, with the ghastly art of the mortician, we try to make the body unpalatable to the worms. And so to stop life, as if to be eaten in due course were an indignity to the human being. Whereas we eat everything else and we give nothing back. So that is a kind of a social symptom of our profound disorientation with respect to death. We think death is unnatural and furthermore, in our culture, we think birth is a disease and send a mama to the hospital for the most unnatural, weird kind of parturition. In other words, more and more one regards the healthy and inevitable and natural transformations of the body as pathological. I can imagine, you know, people having sexual intercourse on an operating table to be sure that the whole thing is hygienic. <laughs> you know, uh, the, a, a, everything about us like that is, is, is become over interfered with by specialists and less and less the province of our own preferences. It's very, very hard indeed to die in your own way without some blasted bunch of relatives come fussing around and insisting that you go to a hospital, that you get fixed with the tortures of being fed through tubes and things to keep you alive indefinitely and waste the family savings. It's even a crime to commit suicide. Now, this is sim simply nonsense. It's this perfect panic to survive at all costs. Jung had a tremendous humor. And he knew that nobody can be completely honest. That you will try and you will have a great deal of success in uh, exploring your motivations and your dark unconscious depths. But there will be a certain point at which you will say, well, I've had enough of that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and do you see how in a strange way there's a certain sanity in that? When a person indulges in a certain kind of duplicity, of deception, there is something, you all laughed when I said that, there was something humorous about it. And this humor is a very funny thing. 
Basically, humor is an attitude of laughter about oneself. There is malicious humor, or, which is laughing at other people. But real deep humor is laughter at oneself. Now, why fundamentally do you laugh about yourself? What makes you laugh about yourself? Isn't it because you know that there is a big difference between what goes on the outside and what goes on the inside? <laughs> that if I hint, you see, that your inside is the opposite of your outside, it makes people laugh. If I don't do it unkindly. If I get up in the attitude of a preacher and say, uh, you're a bunch of miserable sinners and you ought to be different, nobody laughs. <laughs> but if I say, well, after all, Boys will be boys and girls will be girls. And we, we all know, then, then, then people laugh. Now, you see, what's, what's happening when we do that? Now, I passed you around a lot of embroidery to look at before we started. And I'm perfectly sure that you got the point that there's a big difference between the front and the back. In some forms of embroidery, the back is very different from the front because people take shortcuts. In the front, everything is orderly, and it is supposed to be kind of messy on the back side. See, which side will you wear? You've got to be sure you get the front in the front, and have the back in the back. The back has all the little tricks in it, all the shortcuts, all the lowdown that people don't acknowledge, you see. And it's exactly the same with the way we live. You know, like sweeping the dust under the carpet in a hurry just before the guests come. I mean, we do ever so many things like that. And if you don't do it, if you don't think you do it, and you think, well, really, I, my embroidery is the same on both sides, see? Well, you're deceiving yourself. Because what you're doing is you're taking the shortcuts in another dimension, which you're keeping out of consciousness. Everybody takes the shortcuts. Everybody plays tricks. Everybody has in himself an element of duplicity of deception. Because you see, from this point of view that I'm discussing, where the web is the trap, to be is to deceive. Think of camouflage, the chameleon who changes its color. Think of the butterfly pretending it has eyes. Think of the flower saying to the bee, like my honey? <laughs> bee says, wow. <laughs> but then that means that the bee has to be, and it has to go on living, and all the trouble it takes to go around collecting honey and raising other bees and organizing itself and doing that dance which tells the other bees where there's more honey. There's all that stuff to do. But the flower was deceptive. Now, in the same way, I've often said, life is, is a drama, and a drama is a deception. It's a big act. When you peel an onion, and you don't really understand the nature of an onion, you might look for the pit in the center, like any ordinary fruit has. But the onion doesn't have a center. It's all skins. And so when you get right down, there's nothing but a bunch of skins. You say, well, that was a kind of disappointing. <laughs> but of course you have to understand that the skins were the part that you eat well in rather the same way you see you find when you explore yourself uh, and your motivations and you go through and through and you try to find out that thing which is really genuine that's why in Zen discipline they give you koans which require a perfectly genuine act an act of total and absolute sincerity and people knock themselves out trying to do this thing, but they always know that the master's going to catch them. Because he reads their thought. Do you know that story of um, von Kleist about the man who had a fight with a bear? And the bear could read his thoughts so that the only way of hitting the bear was to do so not on purpose. Because the bear would know in advance. So it's the same in working with a Zen master. You have to do the genuine act not on purpose. But since you are put in a situation where 
it's rather formal and you're supposed to do it on purpose, you're stuck, you see. So you explore the onion and you go in and in and in and then you find, well, uh, it's all a deception. Now then the question arises, who's deceiving who? Who's fooling who? I'm fooling me? What is fooling? Fooling is playing like you're there when you're not. You know, getting somebody else to answer your name in the roll call. <laughs> so, we're all, you see, this is the metaphysical basis of it. This is what the Hindus mean by maya, the world illusion. The world is playing it's there when it isn't. And it's a trap. And it sucks you in. And you can't get out of it. And it's a thorough big trap too. But always when you get an idea like this or a feeling like this, follow it to its extreme. Don't back out from it. If you find you're selfish, go to the extreme of what selfishness means. Confusion largely results from not following feelings or ideas to their depth. You know, people think they want to be immortal. They'd like to live forever. Do you really want to do that? Think about it. Really go into it, what it would be like. People say they want this, that and the other. They want this kind of car, they want this kind of dress or so on, and um, this much money and so on. It's always a good idea to think it right through. What it would involve to be in that situation, to have those desires fulfilled. Also, when you form a relationship to another person, think it through too. You see? How inconvenient could they be? <laughs> However attractive. And uh, always turn the em embroidery round and look at the underside, but don't get caught doing it. <laughs> See, that's something one does on the side, in secret. Because otherwise you play the game that everything is as it's supposed to be on the front. But that makes you humorous, and that makes you human. Out of Your Mind now continues with the next lecture from the Web of Life Lecture Series. Medieval society in the West, comparable to Hindu society, allowed people to check out of the game. It, it, it revered and encouraged hermits, monks, nuns, of various types of discipline. There's this difference, you see, for the West and India. You couldn't join the Brahmana caste, the priest <coughs> caste, from some other caste. But in the European caste system, by becoming a priest or a cleric of any kind, you see, a cleric means simply a literate person. You could familiarize with any other caste once you're in that one. And so it was a wonderful way of rising in society. You could, from being a serf, go to being a priest to being an archbishop and consort with the nobility. It was the only way open to cross castes, you see, and because they were the literate people, it was through literacy and through universities founded by clerics that our caste system began to break. And we got the idea of choosing your own vocation and not simply following what your parents did. Now I want to make an observation here about checking out of the game. This is not encouraged in contemporary society. Because the Catholic Church 
and the, say, the Episcopalian Church are very powerful minorities, they can still support monasteries and even hermits. But you can't be one on your own without great difficulty. Firstly, because you're a poor consumer. See, around here, there are, we have a number of hermits. There's a guy out there building that boat, and he's essentially a non-joiner, a poor consumer. And uh, the community, uh, they live a lot along here. And they're mostly, they're not um, working class people. They are people who dropped out of college because they saw it was stupid. And they're that sort of people. We would call them perhaps beatniks. Uh, but you see, the city doesn't like it because they aren't owning the right sort of cars and therefore the local car salesman isn't doing business through them. Uh, they don't have lawns and so nobody can sell them lawn mowers. They hardly uh, use dishwashers, appliances of that kind. They don't need them. And also they wear blue jeans and uh, things like that and so the local dress shops feel a bit put out having these people around. And they, have very, they live very simply. Well, they, you, you mustn't do that. You've got to live in a complicated way. You've got to have the, the kind of car, you know, that identifies you as a person of substance and status and all that. So there's a great problem here in our society. Now, why is there this problem? There's always a very inconsiderable minority of these non-joiners or people who check out of the game. But you will find that insecure societies are the most intolerant of those who are non-joiners. They are so unsure of the validity of their game rules that they say everyone must play. Now that's a double bind. You can't say to a person, you must play. Because what you're saying is, you are required to do something which will be acceptable only if you do it voluntarily. <laughs> you see? So everyone must play is the rule in the United States. And it's the rule in um, almost all Republican governments. I mean Republican in the sense of uh, de Democratic. <laughs> because they're very uneasy. Because everybody is responsible. You mean you may try not to be and avoid it and say, oh, let the senators take care of it or the president. But theoretically, everyone's responsible. Now, that's terrifying. See, it's all like when you know what's right. There is an aristocracy, there is the clergy, and they know what should, should be done, and they're used to ruling, you see. But now it's, it's in your hands. You say, well, what, what, are, what are we going to do? Well, I think this way, and you think that way, and he thinks the other way. And so we're all unsettled. And therefore, we become more and more conformist. Individualism, rugged individualism, always leads to conformism. Because people get scared. And so they herd together, and it compounded with industrial society, mass production, etc. They all wear the same clothes. And they're sensible clothes that don't show the dirt too much. And uh, we get duller and drabber and... Uh, with the exception of the Californian Revolution. Uh, <laughs> so it, what, the reason for this is, in a way, that democracy as we have tried it started out on the wrong foot. You see, in the scriptures, in the Christian scriptures, it says everybody is equal in the sight of God. Now, that's a mystical utterance. That means that from the standpoint of God, all people are divine and are playing their true function. And that is something that is true on a certain plane of consciousness. But come down a step and try to apply the mystical insight 
in the practical affairs of everyday life, and what do you get? You get a parody of mysticism. You get the idea, not that everybody is equal in the sight of God, but that all people are equally inferior. And that's why all bureaucracies are rude, why the police are rude, and why you are made to wait in lines and uh, are uh, obstreperous income tax individuals and all, all that sort of person. <coughs> because everybody's a crook. Everybody's equally inferior. See, that becomes the parody of democracy. And that kind of society, watch out for it. It turns in a quick click into fascism because of its terror of the outsider. Now, a free and easy society loves outsiders. In fact, it's a little bad for the outsider's integrity because he becomes a holy man, see? And uh, people make uh, salams and uh, give him food and uh, all that. They really take care of the outsider because they know that man is doing for us what we haven't got the guts to do. That outsider who lives up there in the mountain is at the highest peak of human evolution. His consciousness is one with the divine. And great, just there is someone like that around. It makes you feel a little better. He is realized. He knows what it's all about. And so we need a number of those people. Even though they don't join our game, they tell us, you see, what you're doing is only a game. It's okay, I'm not going to condemn you, but it is only a game, and we up on that mountaintop are watching you. We love you. We have compassion for you. And, uh, but excuse, please, we aren't going to join. <laughs> So that gives the community great strength because it tells the government in no uncertain terms that there's something more than government. That's why wise kings kept not only priests but court fools. The court fool is much more effective than the priest to remind the king that after all he's human. And... Uh, you know how in Richard II, where the fool is called the antic, the king says, within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his watch. And there the antic sits, scoffing at his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a little time to monarchize, be feared and kill with looks. And then at last comes death and with a pin bores through his castle wall. And farewell, king. See, always this reminder of the priest or of the antic to the royalty, to the government. You are going to die. You are mortal. Don't give yourself airs and graces as if you were a god. As king, you are only a representative of God. And there is a force, there are domains, uh, way, way beyond yours and way, way higher. But it's very difficult for a Republican government to realize that because it's insecure. And therefore, in our present world, you cannot abandon nationality without the greatest difficulty. People who try to abandon nationality get constantly deported from one place to another. You must belong to this thing, as Thoreau put it. However far into the forests you may go, men will pursue you and compel you to belong to their desperate company of odd fellows. <laughs> <laughs> We've got all sorts of ideas built into us which seem unquestioned, obvious, and our speech reflects them. The commonest phrases face the facts as if they were outside you, as if uh, life was something you simply encountered as a foreigner. Face the facts. Our common sense has been rigged, you see, so that 
we feel strangers and aliens in this world and this is terribly plausible simply because it's what we're used to that's the only reason but when you really start questioning this say is that the way I have to assume life is I know everybody does but does that make it true it doesn't necessarily it ain't necessarily so And so then, you, as, as you question this basic assumption that underlies our culture, uh, you find you get a new kind of common sense. It becomes absolutely obvious to you that you are continuous with the universe. For example, people used to believe that the people who lived in the Antipodes would fall off. And that was scary. But then when somebody sailed around the world, and we all got used to it, and now we, we travel around in jet planes and everything, we have no problem about feeling that the Earth is globular. None whatever. We got used to it. So in the same way, Einstein's relativity theories, the curvature of the propagation of light, that began to bother people when Einstein started talking like that. But now we're all used to it. Well, in a few years, it will be a matter of common sense to very many people that they are one with the universe. It'll be so simple. And then maybe, if that happens, we shall be in a position to handle our technology with more sense. With love instead of with hate for our environment. This concludes Session 2 of Out of Your Mind, Essential Listening, from the Alan Watts Audio Archives. Our program continues with Session 3. Now, what I would call a really swinging human being is a person who lives on two levels at once. He's able to live on the level of being his ordinary ego, his everyday personality, and play his role in life and to observe all the rules and so on that go with that. But if he's only on that level, if he's only playing that kind of thing and thinks that's all there is, it becomes a drag. And he starts being the kind of person who feels that he's just got to go on surviving. See? It's terribly important to go on surviving, to live. And uh, he works at that. And his uh, children learn the same attitude from him. And they, you know, he says, well, I, I've got to survive because I've got all these children I've got to support and so on and so forth. And then they take the same attitude and they breed up children and they <coughs> feel compulsive about supporting them because they've got to go on. And so nobody really has any fun. It's just, <coughs> we've got to make this thing, you see. And you don't have to. See, whenever I get somebody who comes to me and says, I really can't go on and I have to commit suicide, I say, well, that's entirely, uh, you're, you're right. There's really no reason why you should go on, and if you want to commit suicide, do it. You can check out. Of course, this reduces anxiety when they feel free to commit suicide. They don't really have to commit suicide so, so much. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you can commit partial suicide. <laughs> so, uh, the sense that you just have to go on living, see, that life is a must. When you say to anything spontaneous, see, life is spontaneous. It happens in the words of the Taoists, Zeran, which means of itself so. That's their Chinese expression for nature. What happens by itself. What isn't pushed, but it just pops up, you see. Like, um, gee, I'll never forget, there was a great Zen master I knew once in New York. He was giving a lecture one evening, and he was dressed in his gold ceremonial robes, 
and he was sitting in front of an altar, like with this sort of thing, and, but he had a table in front of him with very formal, with candles on it and a sutra scripture on a little desk. And he was lecturing on the sutra. And he said, um, fundamental principle in Buddhism is no purpose, purposelessness. When you drop fart, you don't say, at nine o'clock I drop fart. <laughs> it happen of itself. <laughs> you know, and all, all these pious <laughs> Western devotees, you know, kind of put their handkerchiefs in their mouths and tried not to laugh. You know? <laughs>